Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us here on this webinar um, under the auspices of OES, Ocean Energy Systems Environmental. We will be talking today about the risk retirement process that OES Environmental has been working on for the last number of years. I'm Andrea Copping with Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, and with me presenting today will be my colleagues Michaela Freeman, Haley Farr, and uh, Debbie Rose. Um, I did want to let everyone know we are recording this webinar and it will be posted uh, later on along with the uh, notes. So you'll be able to hear the audio, but also the questions and answer afterwards. Um, uh, and also throughout the webinar, please feel free to ask questions. Do that by going to your chat box and enter the questions and we will take a look at those and answer them as we go along and uh, have a Q&A period at the end. Okay, with that, I think we'll get started. Um, uh, could I have the next slide, please? All right, today we have quite a bit to cover. Um, we're gonna try to keep it moving along. We're gonna introduce a background and uh, talk about this risk, so-called risk retirement process we have been following, as well as the data transferability process that goes along with it. We're gonna talk about some of the outreach and engagement we've been doing around this topic and then give you an overview of some of the um, areas we've been working in, specifically underwater noise as a stressor from marine renewable devices, uh, electromagnetic fields, specifically from cables, and also changes in both benthic and pelagic habitat. And then we'll conclude our presentation talking about the next steps we plan to take. Um, and at that point, we really hope to have some lively discussion. So we're going to start talking about the concept of risk retirement that's been developed by OES and environmental um, and then apply it to these specific stressors. We have had this is really trying to bring together the work we've been doing over the past year, year and a half or so. And we hope to be able to really work with the overall community. And this includes the uh, device and project developers, regulators, researchers and others. And this is the, really the pathway we see forward to understanding environmental effects of marine renewables and specifically to apply those towards consenting or permitting. And then we, while we are presenting to you, as it were, we really are interested in getting feedback on risk retirement. Next slide, please. Um, I think everybody on this call has a pretty good idea of what we're talking about. Um, marine renewable energy, of course, it covers more than wave and tidal energy, but that really is where the focus in the world has been to date with most of the development and deployments. And we will, will focus largely on waves and tides, talking a little bit about um, also work that has been done in the large rivers, uh, which we're using sort of the equivalent of tidal devices. We recognize the industry is still in early stages of development, deployment and commercialization. And we know that environmental concerns are still continuing to slow consenting or permitting in many countries around the world. Next slide, please. So I've mentioned OES Environmental. The um, Ocean Energy Systems, uh, or OES, is one of the uh, international collaborations under the International Energy Agency. And one of the tasks under OES is called OES Environmental, which is a little bit confusing, I recognize. This task has been running under OES for 10 years now, just about. Um, here at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, one of US Department of Energy's labs, we lead this task. We currently have 15 countries uh, involved. We're just finishing up our third phase and starting into our fourth phase of this work. And the overall uh, gist of it really is to look at environmental effects of marine renewables but specifically to help with the consenting or permitting for uh, getting devices in the water. And this focus this past year and a half has been on risk retirement and data transferability. We also support the TEFIS website, which you see the um, uh, URL there, tethys.pnnl.gov. And we, among other things, that has a robust collection of literature, but we also uh, record and coordinate activities off TFIS, and you will find this and other webinars there. Um, this one will go up uh, quite shortly. And I do want to note that this phase has concluded with writing a state of the science report. We wrote the first one in 2016. This is the follow-up in 2020. 
the draft came out in June and uh, allowed for a comment period and the final will be out before the end of this month. So really, really shortly. This is a pretty extensive document. It's over 300 pages. You can download it, pieces of it, chapter by chapter. We had over um, 30 authors from four different countries and a lot of input from the community. Next slide, please. Okay, so what are we gonna talk about today? We are really looking at environmental effects through this sort of lens of stressors and receptors, where the stressors are those parts of the marine renewable system that can cause injury, death, stress, dis disturbance to animals and habitats and processes in the oceans. Um, and we've really, over the last 10 years or so, I think kind of honed this down to about seven major stressors. And you see them there, collision risk, underwater noise, EMF, changes in habitat, changes in oceanographic systems, and potential entanglement or entrapment of marine animals in uh, uh, lines and cables. The last one, displacement, is really, I think we are all aware that displacing animals from areas with extensive MRE development may be problematic, but we have really not been able to do much work in that um, space simply because there aren't enough devices in the water. However, today in talking risk retirement, we're gonna focus on just three of these stressors, underwater noise, EMF, and habitat change. Next slide, please. Okay, I've been saying risk retirement. What are we talking about here? Because it's uh, turned out to be a bit of a loaded term. What we are after is to be able to say that for certain interactions, potential risks probably don't need to be fully investigated for every new project for small numbers of devices. We're talking one, two, three devices of tidal or wave uh, uh, machines. What instead though, we hope to be able to rely on what's already known. That is data sets from already consented or permitted projects, uh, uh, directed research projects, or what we've learned from analogous industries. It's important to note that if we retire a risk, it's not dead, it's simply gone away temporarily, and it can be revived in the future as more information becomes available, particularly as we look at larger arrays. This idea of risk retirement can't replace or contradict any existing regulatory processes anywhere in the world. It's simply a way of trying to simplify the information available and make it readily accessible. Okay, next slide. And with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Michaela Freeman to walk us through the work we've been doing. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, so with this concept of risk retirement, we developed a risk retirement pathway shown here to assess this ability to retire risk for MRE projects. And it leverages, as Andrea mentioned, what's already known and available to streamline consenting or permitting processes. We really aim to develop a systematic process to gather the information needed to consent a project and assess the potential impact, analyze the information, and determine if there is a risk. So I'm going to walk you through uh, the pathway, starting on the left uh, with the two circles here. When you're submitting an application for an MRE development, it's important to have a really good project description. So the pathway starts here with describing the stressors. Uh, such as how many devices, what types of device, how they operate, really just that project description. And also describing the marine animals, habitats, or uses of the ocean, as we call receptors that occur in the same area. From here, we enter into the pathway, which is a series of stage gates. In stage gate one, uh, we use this information of stressors and receptors um, to define the potential risk of a project. So is there something that the device might cause harm to the defined receptors? If it's determined that there's not a plausible, plausible risk, there's an off-ramp shown by the down arrow here. Um, and if, um, which that denotes that the particular risk for that situation can be retired. However, if there may be a reasonable risk, move on to stage gate two. Here you examine existing data and assess if the data provides enough information to determine if this risk is no longer a concern. If that's the case, there's another off-ramp and you would consider it to be retired. However, if sufficient data is not available or uncertainties remain, you move on to stage gate three. Here it's important for the applicant in conjunction with the regulator to develop a monitoring program and collect data to better understand a potential risk to see if it is acceptable. Once the data has been collected and examined, and if a risk remains, you move on to stage gate four. 
At this point, mitigation is likely needed and it's important to determine if there are existing mitigation measures that are adequate um, and have been tested and shown to be effective. If that's the case, you can mitigate the risks and take the off-ramp below. If there aren't adequate, adequate mitigation measures, you move on to stage gate five, where it might be necessary to develop and test novel mitigation measures. If these new measures are effective, you can retire the risk. However, if this still isn't adequate, you continue down the pathway. At this point, if the risk is significant and can't be mitigated, it's important to consider redesigning the project, moving to another more suitable location, or even abandoning the project altogether. And as I mentioned, this is how we are using risk retirement to assess what risks might be um, there for a different MRE project. And in this pathway, having access to relevant data and information is extremely important. So we developed a data transferability process, which I'll describe in more detail in the next few slides, but I did wanna point it out that it's really a key component in moving towards risk retirement, specifically in stage gate two. So if sufficient data doesn't exist for the specific location or project that you're trying to consent or permit, the data transferability process can be employed to investigate if there's sufficient data from another site or an analogous industry, which can inform risk retirement for the project in question. And I also want to note at the top, there are dotted lines and arrows, which implies that there are feedback loops between and among the different stage gates. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so by engaging with the international marine renewable energy community through online webinars, conference workshops, and regulator surveys in OES environmental countries, it became apparent that there was a need for sharing data between MRE projects to help advance the industry. We believe that data and information collected through research studies and monitoring from other projects should be able to inform new projects. And in addition, data and information from analogous industries may be used when impacts or effects are similar and comparable. We do recognize that some site-specific data will be needed for all new projects, but that existing data should be used as much as possible and that data transfer can reduce some of those site-specific needs. And by data, we mean this can include raw or quality control data, but more likely it comes in the form of analyzed or synthesized data, information, or reports. And it's important to note that data that might be transferred should be collected consistently to allow for comparison. So next I'm gonna walk through the uh, data transferability process that we developed to um, show how data transferability can be implemented. So in order to do this, um, we have this process shown here, which includes a framework as the focal point, as well as a data collection consistency table, monitoring data sets, discoverability matrix, and best management practices. The framework classifies these stressor receptor interactions and contains the overarching principles that guide the transfer of data. The data collection consistency table outlines parameters for comparison of data between projects, including preferred measurement methods or processes, reporting units, and most common methods of analysis or use of data. And our colleagues here at PNNL um, have led the Triton Initiative, who have expanded on this concept and who have assessed environmental monitoring methods and technologies and have started conducting field trials. Uh, the monitoring data sets discoverability matrix catalogs relevant data sets in an online interactive tool that allows users to easily find data uh, based on the approach presented in the framework. And this data can be transferred for developers who are putting together an application, regulators consenting a project and looking for information, or anyone else in the marine renewable energy industry who's looking to find specific data. And we just released this tool earlier this summer, um, which you can find on TFIS at the URL at the bottom. We have a page that walks you through the entire data transferability process and all of our outreach and engagement efforts. And then we've also um, added a link to the matrix specifically so that you can check out that tool. Lastly is the best management practices, which suggests four practices to guide and implement data transfer. And these components all work together to achieve um, reasonable data transfer between and among projects. And as I mentioned, I just want to reiterate that data transfer is really a key aspect of the risk retirement project process. Next slide. 
So in order to receive feedback on both risk retirement and data transferability, we've been conducting outreach and engagement with those in the marine renewable energy community for several years now. Um, as Andrea mentioned, even with this webinar, we want to make sure we are getting feedback on the usability and application of the processes that we're developing. And so over these several years in this different outreach and engagement efforts, we want to ensure that these processes work for those who we anticipate using them and that developing them is an iterative process where we continue to receive feedback. So continuing on past efforts engaging the U.S. regulatory community, we held two online workshops to receive feedback on risk retirement and the pathway. This was more when we were in the process of developing what risk retirement means and how we use it. Uh, over the past year, we've also held three workshops at international events focusing on discussions of risk retirement for underwater noise and EMF. And we've also recently held one online workshop on risk retirement for habitat change. Uh, these were at the European Wave and Tidal Energy Conference, or UTEC, the Ocean Renewable Energy Conference, um, and a workshop in Sydney, Australia. And then the last one was an expert workshop held online, as all our events are now. Um, overall, we've engaged almost 140 members of the marine renewable energy community as we work to understand if these uh, risks can be retired. Um, and as we discuss each of the three stressors in the next several slides, we'll present feedback we received during these events. Um, I do want to note that all workshop reports are linked in this presentation here and available on TFIS. So if you're interested in um, seeing more information about the feedback we received, those are here. And then the expert workshop has a link uh, to both the workshop report as well as a recording from that where you can listen more about our discussion about uh, retiring habitat change. Next slide, please. So with that, we're gonna jump into um, presenting our evidence bases and feedback from the three stressors, underwater noise, EMF, and habitat change. So we're gonna start with underwater noise here. And you'll see there's a link here. We have compiled a large evidence base for each of these stressors consisting of um, reports and articles and other observations. And you can find all of those on TFIS. Uh, so if you're interested, please do take a look. You can also find a lot of this information easily accessible through the matrix as well. So just to give a little background on underwater noise, uh, marine animals use underwater sound for navigation and communication. Sounds from marine renewable energy devices may add to other anthropogenic sources in the marine environment. Um, and these can disturb animals, especially marine mammals and fish, but also diving birds. Excess underwater noise can cause physical harm, including loss of hearing ability, physical harm to tissues, or behavioral changes such as avoidance or attraction to an area. We do know that shipping and other industry noises are much louder than marine renewable energy. For MRE, noise concerns generally come from construction, which is not new to the marine environment, and we know a lot from other industries, including mitigation measures to limit impacts. Operational noise, on the other hand, from marine renewable energy is likely to be much lower. And in general, it's unlikely for noise from MRE to cause harm to marine animals, and we're beginning to see measurements from single turbines and wave devices. So in the next few slides, I'm gonna walk through some of the evidence base gathered um, for underwater noise, which we presented at the workshops. So first, um, there are some thresholds and guides for measurements that exist. Uh, the U.S. has developed regulatory thresholds consisting of technical guidance for marine mammals and for fish. For marine mammals, temporary and permanent impacts to hearing are found from noise 153 decibels and higher. And the thresholds for harm or injury differs for different types of pinnipeds and cetaceans for temporary threshold shifts for non-impulsive sounds and permanent threshold shifts. Uh, and so this guidance here is based on those different groups. Um, and again, the lower limit is 153 decibels and increases from there. For fish, physical and behavioral effects are found from noise 150 decibels and higher. Um, and for physical, and, um, and these are the physical and behavioral effects to the fish, which is included in this guidance as well. And of course, differs a little bit between based on the categories that they've defined. In addition, the International Electrotechnical Commission, or IEC, 
has developed international specifications that provide methods and instrumentation to characterize sound near marine renewable energy devices. And this helps to standardize me measurements across the industry and can hopefully lead to more data transfer as data is collected consistently. Um, both of these, all of these provide useful aids to measure underwater noise and assess potential impacts from marine renewable energy devices. So this table here is not meant to be read in full right now. I know there's a lot of text there, but I do want to highlight um, that this list includes measurements from deployed wave and tidal devices. Most operational noise from these measurements that we've compiled are below these, the US regulatory thresholds that I just mentioned. In a few cases, there were instances of measured noise above those thresholds, but this was dominated by noise unrelated to the device and only found for small amounts of time, such as 1% of deployment. There were several noises found to be higher than expected due to a broken part of the device, which makes the point that monitoring for underwater noise is not only useful for assessing environmental concerns, but also for engineering and monitoring device health. And this is a really nice pairing of how monitoring can be used for several um, different reasons. And again, this slide only shows a few examples from the table, which can be found in full in the 2020 State of the Science in the underwater noise chapter. So I do recommend um, looking at this. There's several measurements and some um, lots of detail included. So next, I just wanna show a quick example of what these measurements can look like. Uh, this is from the Fred Olson Lifesaver deployed at the Hawaii Wave Energy Test Sites. It's a floating point absorber wave device. And for this deployment, measurements were taken in 2016 using three CBAN mounted hydrophones and two drifting hydrophones. The graph um, shown here shows the expected noise given by the manufacturer in gray and the measured noise from the power takeoff during standard operation um, as well. And we can see based on the graph that the noise levels of this device remain below the US thresholds I mentioned. Um, in addition, I'm gonna try playing a clip of the noise recording. Um, we've kind of had varying success with this, so I hope that you all can hear it. I do wanna note that the sound level will depend on how your volume is turned up. So at this time, um, turn up your volume if you can't hear it. And I do want to mention it is just in general a bit of a faint noise, so um, do turn up your volume. Hopefully you are able to hear that. Again, we are playing a noise measured underwater in air and on your computer, so the sound level will depend on your volume, so do note that. Um, so feedback from the UTEC Ocean Renewable Energy Conference and Australia workshop um, is listed here. Overall, we started asking participants for feedback on the risk retirement pathway, which they found intuitive and easy to navigate. Regarding um, underwater noise, there was consensus from workshop participants that this risk can be retired, again, for single devices or small arrays only. With that, they did note some caveats or knowledge gaps, including the need to better understand how marine animals use the surrounding habitat and how they might respond to device noise, the need to verify noise propagation models, especially for larger arrays, and we also need to assess cumulative effects as there are many anthropogenic sources of underwater noise in the marine environment. Recommendations from the workshop included a need to create a library of standardized noise measurements and this is where the specifications of TC114 um, can really be useful here. And then lastly was the recommendation that test centers could play a key role in measuring operational underwater noise. So that is all I have for underwater noise. I'm gonna hand it over to Haley who will present on EMF. Uh, before we get started, I'd just like to remind everyone that the full EMF evidence base is available on TFIS, as well as those for noise and habitat changes. And of course, we'll be making these slides and a recording of this webinar available online as well. So moving right along. Uh, so electromagnetic fields are generated by the movement of electrons and can come from a variety of natural and anthropogenic sources, including marine renewable energy devices and their associated offshore um, substations and subsea cables. Since many marine animals use the Earth's natural magnetic field for things like orientation, navigation, and hunting, um, electromagnetic fields from marine renewable energy may disrupt those animals' natural behaviors, reproductive success, or migratory patterns. 
However, uh, anthropogenic electromagnetic fields have been around in the marine environment for quite some time, and we have some idea of their strength and extent from various sources. So I'm not going to spend much time on this table, but I'd just like to highlight that there are electromagnetic field measurements available for various subsea cables around the world. And if you'd like to take a closer look, this table is available in the 2020 State of the Science Report. All right, moving into the evidence space, these first two studies are some of the first to investigate marine species responses to anthropogenic electromagnetic fields from offshore renewables specifically. Gil et al. used acoustic telemetry tags to examine benthic elasmobrinks response to the type and magnitude of electromagnetic fields generated by offshore wind power cables. Under controlled conditions, the research team placed individual hornback rays, spur dogs, and lesser spotted dogfish, or cat sharks, um, into either control or experimental mesocosm. They found that while some of the rays and dogfish exhibited some behavioral responses uh, to being near the energized cable, there was no evidence to suggest a positive or negative effect on benthic elasmobranchs overall. Right, so similarly, Westerberg and Lagerfeld also used acoustic telemetry tags, but instead to study the effects of an unburied subsea power cable on 60 migrating European eels in the Baltic Sea. Again, while they found the eels swam more slowly over the energized cable, the effect was small, and there was no evidence of the cable acting as a barrier to movement. Finally, Hutchison et al. examined the impacts of the cross sound cable on the movement and migration of the American lobster and little skate. Similar to Gill et al., they used acoustic telemetry tags to track the movement of individuals within cages. Haley, you're cutting in and out a little bit. Is this any better? Yes. Following its publication, PackWave, the wave energy testing facility off the coast of Oregon, was able to take additional monitoring requirements off the table for electromagnetic fields and were instead approved to simply bury the cable. Right, so after we presented the risk retirement pathway and EMF evidence base at the UTEC and Australia workshops in 2019, overall the workshop participants agreed that the risk could be retired for single devices or small arrays. Um, this is largely in part because of the level of power expected to be carried in marine renewable energy cables, and that it's very small compared to those used in the offshore wind energy industry. The participants also acknowledge that there are several remaining knowledge gaps including the need for field measurements to improve and validate numerical models, the need for increased understanding of how electromagnetic fields with very vary with different cable configurations and power variability, and then um, the risks associated with offshore substations and draped cables on pelagic species. Moving on to the recommendations, a major theme of discussion was the need to work with the marine renewable energy industry to help regulators understand that the risk will be minimal, and that additional measurements may be needed as larger devices and arrays are deployed. And with that, I'll pass things off to Debbie. Great, thank you, Haley. Um, so following the workshops on noise and EMF and based on some of the feedback we received there, we hosted an online workshop with invited international experts to focus on the evidence base for habitat change and the potential for risk retirement there. Um, and as mentioned, the recording and the full report are available on TITIS at this link shown on this slide. Um, for today, I'll just provide a brief overview of the habitat structure, a few research studies from the evidence base that support the idea of risk retirement, and feedback that we received from experts at the workshop. Uh, next slide, please. So habitat change can be caused by many facets of MRE device installation, operation, and decommissioning. This image provides an overview of areas where changes in habitat could occur on the seafloor due to installation of the device foundation, anchors, or cables in a variety of formats. Changes can also occur within the water column with presence of new hard structures that attract colonizing or reefing organisms. In the discussion of habitat change with experts, the habitat change stressor was divided into four categories, three of which I will present examples from today. The first category discussed was learning from surrogate industries, um, and it was clear that MRE can learn a lot from existing ocean uses historically and more recently from offshore wind. 
The other categories for habitat change are effects of device installation slash removal on the benthos, changes in community composition on and near devices, and artificial reef effect. For each category, I will present one study from the evidence base that has contributed to how we're thinking about risk retirement for habitat change. Next slide, please. For effects of device installation and removal on the benthos, we focused on the effects to the seafloor community that is disturbed when devices, anchors, or cables are installed. This study is completed at the SeaGen Tidal Turbine in Northern Ireland. Diver video surveys were completed before and at multiple times after installation. Analysis of the video collected showed that approximately 50% of the visible surface area of the device had been colonized, fully replacing the area disturbed by the device installation. Given the rate of colonization at the device, it was anticipated that after decommissioning, the benthic community would recover rapidly. Next slide, please. This category focuses on changes to the communities on and near devices, typically looking at biofouling and benthic community changes in the epibenthos or the infauna. In this study, surveys were conducted at harbors and marinas throughout the Orkney Archipelago where MRE deployment and service vessels operate, and at several structures associated with the MRE industry at EMEC test areas during the same period, including wave rider buoys shown on the right and a mounted acoustic Doppler current profiler shown on the left. Analysis of the biofouling community data identified significant differences in the fouling communities between harbors and marinas and MRE, MRE infrastructure due to the presence of several key species. Six non-native species were also identified at harbors or marinas, but none were recorded at wave and tidal testing sites. This study shows that while key biofouling species are present in harbors and marinas where MRE devices will be serviced, these species were not transported to the device environments. These findings also suggest that MRE devices will likely be colonized by species already present in the surrounding community at the deployment location, not by new fouling species or non-native species. Next slide, please. So any structure in the marine environment, including an MRE device, has the potential to be colonized by fouling organisms and then act as an artificial reef by attracting fish and other mobile animals. This literature review shown here provides a com comprehensive look at devices and structures that are comparable to MRE devices to understand and predict possible artificial reefing effects, specifically across the US West Coast and Hawaii. This, the review finds that wave and tidal devices placed on or near the seabed in the coastal waters of the US West Coast and Hawaii likely will function as small scale artificial reefs and attract potentially high densities of reef associated fishes and that water column and surface expression of devices in Hawaii will function essentially as a fish aggregating device with species assemblages varying by distance to the shore and depth. The results of the review also indicated that some of the proposed negative effects of wave energy structures on special status fish species, such as increased predation of juvenile salmonids or rockfishes are not likely. Next slide, please. So from the presentation of these studies, as well as many others that were excluded from today's presentation um, and from the feedback of experts, we have just a few things to share with you. Um, the consensus was that most risks could be retired for habitat change for small numbers of devices, though the experts noted some key ca caveats for each category of risk, primarily due to knowledge gaps. To date, very few devices have been decommissioned, so there's very little known about the recovery processes or what the best course of action is at the end of a device life. Biofouling and concern about non-native species remained a key concern for monitoring and further study, with special focus on understudied environments, such as high energy tidal environments. Expert recommendations were to continue baseline and post-installation monitoring programs to improve understanding, especially in preparation for scaling up to arrays, and to establish guidelines, standardized mitigation, and frameworks for this monitoring, including required baseline condition and species surveys. That's all I have for Habitat, and at this point, I'll turn it back over to Andrea. Thanks so much, Debbie, uh, Haley, and Michaela. Okay, um, that was a really quick gallop through what we've been doing with risk retirement. Just to sort of summarize that a little bit, um, what we're really trying to do with risk retirement and data transferability is provide some tools and some assistance um, for consenting and permitting. It says here regulators, but this really applies across the uh, MRE community. We're trying to really get down past this um, sort of first 
flush concerns about risk. In many cases, the risks may be real. In other cases, they may be perceived risks because we simply don't have enough available data and that level of uncertainty is, is um, driving some concern. But, but through this risk retirement and data transferability process, we hope to make better access to available data. You will find if you go on the um, webinar page at TETHIS that we did a webinar on the um, data transferability matrix, which um, uh, Michaela uh, mentioned earlier. And we are populating that ma matrix with available data sets or links to those data sets from already consented or permitted projects. So where we think we are right now is from the feedback of the workshops and expert forums we've held, we think that the risk from underwater noise and EMF can be retired for single devices or one, two small arrays um, with the caveats that were mentioned of having to get build up libraries of uh, sound from different kinds of devices, better understanding of what um, different cable configurations and power levels emit in terms of EMF and so on. And there's some aspects of habitat change that we think can also be retired, whereas there's still some discussions that need to take place perhaps in some other aspects of habitat retirement, uh, risk retirement. Um, from here, we want to continue to look at some of the other stressors uh, and see where the, they might stand along this risk retirement pathway. In particular, for the tidal industry, collision risk remains the highest level uh, concern. Um, we didn't take this on immediately because this one really is a thorny problem. And while there are data sets starting to come in of monitoring of marine mammals and some fish up close to devices, we still really do not have a good handle on what that potential risk for collision or close encounters might look like. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of next steps, we have been amassing these evidence bases of the scientific studies as you've heard today. But we recognize that particularly as we get into consenting or permitting processes, they don't necessarily fall neatly into the different categories for EIAs, EISs, per licensing, permitting, et cetera. So what we are doing now is we are writing what we're calling guidance documents, where we are taking those scientific findings and trying to sort of, on a general basis, slot them into the kinds of uh, regulations, statutes, laws, et cetera, that matter. And these are things like, do, they, do the uh, laws of concern address animals, uh, different species and populations? Uh, and those uh, kinds of laws differ across nations. In the US, we have our Endangered Species Act, Marine Mammal Protection Act. When you uh, move to Canada, there are species at risk, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we hope to have the, and then others may fall into more habitat or um, aerially based protections. Others look at water quality, sediment transport, while there are uh, key socioeconomic, cultural and historical uh, regulations that need to be considered as well. And we cannot address all of those issues across the board, but we believe these scientific evidence bases can be parsed so that they are most useful and available. Um, in those terms. We are going to write these um, guidance documents across the uh, OES environmental countries and use them to help consent uh, small uh, uh, projects. We hope um, that this will make the data transferability process we've de defined very readily available. And as we move forward, each country will be trying to take this sort of uh, broad guidance with the scientific evidence base and make it more accessible for those country specific regulations. Um, as we have been doing with um, underwater noise EMF and habitat change, we are looking at changes in oceanographic systems. This is changes in circulation, uh, decrease in wave heights, changes in um, things like sediment transport that may affect um, water quality and ultimately ecosystem processes. We are developing a white paper with the evidence base and potential for risk retirement. This one's a little different because of course, the um, evidence base, if you will, for changes in oceanographic conditions from marine renewables is pretty much um, uh, exclusively looked at through numerical models at this point of which there are many, many. So we're working on that right now and we will continue to uh, work with the experts in that field. Next. Next slide, please. 
Okay, I think that's really it for today. I just want to, you've heard from a small number of us who are working on this. I just want to point out that it takes a very large team. There's our, our really great team at uh, Pacific Northwest National Lab and the 15 nations who have been um, collaborating on this OES environmental process through uh, the last four years. We are, as I mentioned, just starting, we're finishing up this uh, third phase that is run uh, through 2020. And we have just been given authorization to go ahead with the first four-year phase. And we are just bringing the countries together who will, we hope will participate in that. We hope to have these countries and even more out of OES. So it's important to recognize that this is really a large team effort. Next slide, please. And that's really all we have to present to you. Our emails are there if you want to contact any of us. We are also very much interested in your feedback here today, but we're also going to be sending you a feedback survey from this uh, link here. You'll receive it if we've uh, got your email from registering today, and we'd love to know what you thought of this webinar and also what you'd like to hear about in the future. But right now, I particularly want to encourage you to ask questions. Please put them in the chat box. Um, and uh, we will try to answer those uh, now. I'm not sure the only questions we've had so far, I think we have answered privately. Um, Andrew, there are two questions, if I'll read them aloud to you. Great, okay. Um, the first one is regarding um, the risk retirement pathway. In step three, we say collect additional data. And so this participant is asking what kind of data um, are you looking for here? Can you give an example of that? Uh, that's that, I'm sorry, I'm not seeing the question. That's uh, regarding the, the risk retirement pathway in general or specific uh, stressors. Risk retirement pathway in general, looking at step okay. three, they're looking for an example of additional ah. data that may be collected. Thank you. Um, could you dial back, uh, Haley, could you go back to the risk retirement pathway just a couple slides back, just so we're all uh, on the same page. Um, yeah, that, that one's great right there. So um, uh, step one, of course, we're defining our risk. Step two, we're looking at existing data. And in step three, and then if we find in step two, there are not sufficient data, that there is still considerable uncertainty. And remember, this is thinking about a specific project in a specific place. It would be important to collect uh, additional data. That would um, require the uh, developer, regulator, researchers to come together and determine what data need to be collected. Let's say, for example, uh, we're talking about underwater noise. We have a sense that it's not a very loud noise that's gonna come out of let's say it's a wave device, but there might be a need to collect more ambient noise data if it's not available. There might be a need to get a, um, a noise um, a sonogram out of that um, particular device that's gonna go in the water. So that's the kind of thing we mean by collecting additional data. In a habitat example, um, having looked at if a, a developer is um, proposing a, a uh, project in a particular location and collects all existing uh, data for the habitats in that area, it might uh, become clear as they move towards a consenting process that there simply isn't enough, uh, say, benthic um, data, uh, benthic habitat that has been characterized around the device. Maybe the area that was surveyed initially was not large enough or no one has actually looked at what um, uh, organisms are in the area that might be um, affected by putting a foundation down on the bottom, etc. So that's really what that means. It's got to be on a site-specific or a project-specific basis whether sufficient data exists. Great, thank you, Andrea. Um, another question, this was sent in during the EMF portion, but um, I think it's um, talking about the U.S. thresholds from underwater noise. So Questions from James. So James, please clarify in the chat if I'm getting this incorrect, but um, he's asking how do U.S. thresholds compare with other parts of the world such as the EU and the UK? Uh, that's a great question, James. Um, we have looked pretty extensively and have not found other um, noise thresholds for disturbance and injury for marine mammals or fish 
in other jurisdictions. Uh, we're, we'd love to be proved wrong. We have not found any in Europe. Um, most of the, um, and I, I can't quote it properly, but most of the European regulation um, has to do with um, very loud percussive noises and it really speaks to um, not causing disturbance to individual animals or populations, et cetera. These are the only numerical thresholds we could find. Um, and so we've tended to kind of go off those, um, but um, uh, we are always looking to see if there are other thresholds set in, um, set in law or in statute or regulation. Great, thanks. And then, um... Someone asked if there's, um, they thought there was more recent EMF information. Can you speak to that? Um, yeah, um, what Haley presented was just a real smattering. If you do go to the um, 2020 State of the Science and the draft State of the Science is up there and there's a whole chapter on EMF that's very extensive. Um, there's uh, a whole number of um, uh, laboratory studies uh, where animals have been challenged with various levels of EMF, both AC and DC, and the outcome looked at in terms of behavior, of developmental, physiological changes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, unfortunately, a great deal of the laboratory work um, that we gives us some idea of EMF is not done with key species. The, some of that work starting to be done now. There's also a whole series of um, uh, field studies that have been done um, to look at effects of energized cables on animals that are transiting, that are in the area, et cetera. So there's really a huge amount of detail there. So I'd really refer you to there. And that, as, I, as we said, that um, final will be out next week, but the um, EMF chapter uh, and the evidence base really hasn't changed very much from what's in the draft, if you wanna go take a look. Great, thank you. Um, so the next question, is um, asking if you can expand on how collision risks might be tackled. So for example, they're looking for information on new sensing methods, determination of marine animal, animal behavior in high flows and experimental tests. A great question. And it's one of the reasons we haven't tackled collision risk because it's really tough. Um, uh, I think that we have been leaning towards using observations, which is really what people have been doing, of animals in close proximity to turbines. Um, well, let me back up. The more standardized way that this has been addressed is using collision risk and encounter risk models, which really are numerical models that make some presumptions about the number of animals that are in an area, therefore potentially at risk, that might be transiting through a um, an area with tidal devices and specifically going through the rotor swept area. And then having adapted those models really from birds and uh, uh, wind turbines, um, some uh, using different kinds of rates of potential strike and so on, outcomes are created. We, have, we believe that those models themselves have flaws when trying to um, adapt them to underwater you know, tidal turbines. And Unfortunately, the data that we have in almost everywhere is not good enough to really get a good sense of what that sort of incoming animal population should look like. So those need to be improved upon and we need to provide better data to um, validate those models. The more common aspect that's occurring right now is just observational. There have been many attempts at using underwater cameras of, of different sorts, still and video, to really look at what animals are doing as they get close to turbines. We're just starting to get some good underwater video of that sort in. Um, as you can imagine, having a video camera looking at a tidal turbine where there's a few marine mammals in an area, your chances of catching them on, on, ta on tape very often is low. Um, so that's been difficult, but we are persevering. We, as the overall international community, I should say, are doing that. However, in many areas, the, you know, the underwater cameras aren't very effective because um, of high turbidity, high flows, et cetera. So underwater acoustics, active acoustics uh, cameras and so on, acoustic cameras are really coming into play too. These, this is still an area that needs a lot of active research because they are very difficult uh, instruments to use, keep running, uh, collect the data effectively in those areas. Um, 
I think we believe as a community that's still the right way forward. If we try to really determine how animals behave in these high flows, it's going to be terribly difficult. There are studies and there will continue to be studies, but um, particularly if you're talking about marine mammals, they are highly intelligent creatures that adapt and learn. And so many of the data sets we've looked at are not consistent. Um, so we really hope that we can get a better sense of how these animals act as they get close to a device, as opposed to just swimming on by. Um, when it comes to fish, there has been a good deal of an experimental work done in flumes in a laboratory, which is always hard to recreate very um, realistic conditions, but those are informing us a good deal of what happens to fish if they go through turbines, if they actually go through. And there's been a few good data sets in the, uh, in the field. So I think these are really the ways we're trying to go forward is just build up that evidence base with more good um, sets of data. If again, the collision risk chapter in the 2020 state of the science is extremely extensive. And I would really refer you to, to look at what's been collected and what the sort of pass forward is. There's also a chapter in the state of the science, another very extensive chapter on the instrumentation that is being used and where we think we can go. And that is largely focused around animals interacting with turbines. So um, it's really just, this is tough stuff to, to, to collect. Great, thank you, Andrea. That was lots of information there. Wonderful. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, that was great. I think exactly what they were asking for. So wonderful. Um, going back to risk retirement in general, um, the question is, are you aware of any regulators having formal processes or approaches in place for risk retirement? Not yet, but it's a great question. Um, we do know that several jurisdictions have been playing around with the idea. I don't know that many have said, okay, risk retirement is what we're doing. But we have had some discussions with Marine Scotland. We've had discussions with some of the Australian regulators. And um, we are really at the point where we hope that the concepts, particularly of data transferability towards risk retirement are getting some uptake. But there are not formal, any formal processes as of yet that I'm aware of. Great, thank you. And again, if, you know, places that we may not, such as thresholds in other countries, or um, if you have experience with any regulators having formal processes, these are all things that we would love to hear about in our feedback survey. So please do make sure you're taking that. And if you have information, um, that would be wonderful to hear. Um, the next question is that given there are so many devices and only some have been parameterized, are there going to be any thresholds to qualify for retirement? So, uh, for example, what if someone designs a noisy wave energy converter and noise is retired by the others? What then? That's a great question. Um, uh, if you look at the evidence base and sort of the outcomes of the, the workshops we've had on underwater noise, one of the key caveats has been the need to build up a library that of sounds, of output sounds from major types of devices. So um, I, let's say a developer has the particular wave energy device and it's been used in other places. We can have some sense of what it's been deployed in some water somewhere, have a sense of what that output sounds like. And with the ability to uh, do a standardized measurement using the TC114 uh, technical specification, we can get a pretty good idea of how to me truly measure that output. But if a novel kind of WEF is, is being developed, um, at the very least, the advice has been that the manufacturer specifications for noise output needs to be put forward as part of that consenting uh, application. And perhaps an actual deployment of that once the deployment occurs, there needs to be another measurement taken to see that that um, uh, you know, output from the manufacturer is more or less right. So we really see this as having to be an iterative process. If a device went forward and was deployed and it was found that the noise levels were much higher than anticipated, there would need to be some sort of adaptive me mechanism for either uh, mitigating that sound or removing the device. 
So it, it, this is never going to be a straightforward noise is retired for WEX for the you know, two devices. It's going to have to be sort of little iterative steps. Great, thank you. Um, we've had a few questions about cumulative impacts. I'm gonna see if I can put these together. Mm -hmm. um, someone is asking if there are any issues around cumulative impacts and risks that might be retired for small numbers of devices becoming significant when there are lots of them? Absolutely. Um, we really are trying to say that what we're working on right now is one, two, uh, maybe up to three devices. I think there are a number of these issues that as the, um, the, the numbers of devices get larger, they have to be re-examined. As an example, electromagnetic fields being um, with certain power level be, being carried in power export cables for two devices is going to likely be quite different than for 10 or 100 devices. So those that may need to be examined as these as these uh, commercializations build out. A re really key one is talking about changes in oceanographic processes. It's not possible to put one or two uh, tidal or wave devices in the water and go out and measure a change due to those devices, simply because any change would be well below the natural variability of the system. However, what would happen if we put 10 or 100 or 1,000 devices out? This is where the numerical models tell us that we expect to see changes. Um, once we get to those levels, we probably will never get to 1,000, but maybe 10 to 50 devices, maybe, it will be important to go back and look at that. Um, and I think that's true for many of them. If we understand how animals react to sound from two devices, how do they perceive the sound field when it's suddenly 10 or 20 devices? But on the, on, on the um, issue of cumulative um, impacts, that is absolutely true as we increase the size of the arrays. It's also true, uh, would be true, we would have to consider what would happen if we had four or five different wave energy projects within a certain uh, area of ocean. That might be something to look at. And even more so, we are putting these devices into the ocean uh, against a background of a lot of other human uses. What do those cumulative impacts look like? Can we determine uh, what the ambient sound from existing users uh, is before we put in wax or, or turbines? Um, so the issue of cumulative impacts, both around arrays, but also in a larger sense, something OES Environmental is very interested in, and it's going to be in our work program some time over the next year or two. Anyone who's ever worked in writing EIAs, EISs, et cetera, and come to that section writing about cumulative impacts knows it's terribly difficult to get any quantitative um, measurements or really to be able to say anything very definitive, but it's something we really do need to look at in this industry. Great, thank you for that answer. Um, so there's been a lot of chat about this next question. Um, someone is asking if risk has been retired, risk retirement has been used in other sectors and that positive experiences could really help convince regulators to adopt this for marine renewable energy. I do want to note we had one comment answering this that said um, they recall um, examples from the oil and gas industries were discussed this uh, were discussed some years ago in the UK and that there's also a lot of support for data sharing amongst national communities. Um, so again the question is has risk retirement been used in other sectors and that this could really help yeah, I, I, that's absolutely true. And as we were writing some of this, um, we recognized that we needed to have that basis. The oil and gas sector, I don't think refers to it as risk retirement, but the concept has been used there. You're absolutely right. We also found this term, quite honestly, first of all, from some geotechnical work where it has been used um, for uh, drilling and um, this kind of uh, activity, which I'm incredibly in, incompetent to discuss. Um, so that it is appearing in the literature from time to time. Um, and I think the principles or the concepts are turning up in things like oil and gas, and also um, some of the land-based development, um, both for shoreline development and other kinds of buildings and so on, um, uses this concept, if not the actual terms. 
But I think this is an area where over the next year, we also need to sort of dig in and um, find some more good analogs and perhaps write those up as, as sort of, uh, you know, trying to point out how this really kind of um, uh, fits with what has been done in other industries. Great. Um, the next question is, we mentioned that developing country specific risk retirement guidance documents will happen. Um, and they're asking, will this be specific to environmental conditions and species or habitats in those countries? Um, that's a great question. Um, we are just in the process of putting sort of a framework, what would these guidance documents look like um, uh, at, at sort of the broad sense. And we have to have those discussions, I think, with the OES environmental um, country uh, representatives. Um, my hope would be that we would be able to um, look, have each uh, country representative and his or her colleagues look through the lens of the statutes and regulations in that country. And, and as I sort of very briefly mentioned, we've sort of divided the kinds of evidence into four bins, one, one dealing with species, particularly species at risk, populations at risk, one dealing with um, the more sort of aerial extent of habitats, um, one dealing with uh, water quality sort of writ large and one dealing with socioeconomics. And we would hope uh, from those four bins that the country uh, analysts, the country representatives would look across their um, environmental regulatory um, field and say, okay, within the species at risk, we have these particular um, uh, uh, laws, the evidence base for say, underwater noise or EMF apply here. I know in Europe, a great deal of this comes through the, the various directives, habitat directive and, you know, et cetera. And so that is what we're hoping to do is align those regulations in a particular country or region with um, what evidence is available so that it is sort of readily available for, for examination and perhaps for application to um, consenting or permitting processes. Great. The next question is, how do we incentivize regulators or developers to continue environmental monitoring once a risk has been retired? Once retired risks or risks retired are not deceased, but it seems tricky to revisit it once it is declared retired. Would it require direct evidence such as stranded animals with obvious signs of device induced injury to unretire a risk? That's a really great question. Um, I think that um, this is going to have to really fit the comfort level of the regulators in the country or region um, uh, that is, uh, you know, writing a, a consent or a permit, a license. Um, and this is where I think having an active adaptive management program associated with consenting is really important so that those kinds of thresholds can be discussed right up front and in the um, uh, application of adaptive management, which I'm guessing most people are familiar with, if you're not, this is sort of this idea of doing to learn, learning by doing, um, that a, and the ones that we've seen that have worked quite well, bring together um, regulators, developers, researchers, and others on a periodic basis to examine any monitoring data that have been collected or any other kind of evidence and to set some thresholds to either change the amount of monitoring, to take some kind of mitigative action, et cetera. Now, the tricky part here, I think, as, as, as uh, someone has identified, is if we say, say, noise has been uh, retired for these two or three devices, so you're likely not collecting additional noise measurements. How would you know if something bad had happened due to noise? Um, I think these are details we haven't been able to work out yet, but there are some hints and sound is a great one. Most developers will have some kind of sound um, collection going on on their devices simply for device health. And this is kind of handy because if that um, uh, sound monitoring for device health begins to show some kind of obvious change from the previous, uh, vo or previous sound escape, uh, um, this will be an, uh, a hint that something perhaps is going wrong and intervention needs to occur. Um, I think the tough one is going to be collision risk again. 
And so perhaps if we can get to retiring risk for probably be species by species to begin with, and I know there's some really interesting data starting to come out of the Magen Tidal um, Project that in indicates that harbor porpoise are pretty aware of these devices and not getting close enough to be harmed. Maybe we would be, quote, retiring a risk for that species for a particular area. Um, in that case, it may be, you know, obvious um, injury found to an animal. Not clear yet. And this is why collision risk has been so difficult to try to really get our arms around. Thank you. Great answer, Andrea. Um, next question, have you had much buy-in from regulators on our proposed approach to data transferability? Uh, good question, thank you. We did, um, we've done a number of these sort of public webinars, but we did a whole series of online workshops, webinars only with regulators. Now we've been working largely in the US as our sort of tr uh, proving ground and We've done um, probably four, six, eight of these, some with the same regulators, some with new ones. And um, I feel like we've moved from a good deal of skepticism to a good deal of, yeah, that makes sense. And I will say that early on, um, what we heard from those regulators was, well, this idea of data transferability is really nice, but how do I find this, these data? How do I get there? And that's the point at which we started to develop this monitoring uh, uh, matrix of um, uh, data sets so that they are easily discoverable. And we have had really good feedback from the regulators we've talked with, which has been largely US, Canada, a little bit in the UK. Um, that they would they find and would find this as it builds out really useful just to be able to say and the way that works is you would you would say i have a project that is a tidal project with a bottom mounted turbine i'm worried about um, harbor seals and harbor porpoise and it's in a quite a narrow but deep channel what other data sets are available that match that? And going through this process and querying the matrix, you should then get access to data sets that are as close a match as possible. Now, everybody recognizes there's not a huge number of these good data sets available in the world yet, but they are coming in. And we believe we're in a position to organize and make those available. So in that sense, I think we've got um, interested we still have our skeptics, but an interested, yes, this could be useful to us from quite a broad range of our regulators. And we are just starting to really roll out this to do it on a more focused basis on the other countries. Yeah, excellent. And we just got a comment that it would be great to organize that kind of workshop for regulators in Europe as well. Um, mm -hmm. I Maybe I'll take this one, Andrea. And yep. Uh, when we started in the U.S., we actually started with a regulator survey to um, understand regulators' understanding and kind of see how initial thoughts for data transferability. So over the past few years, we've been rolling out that same regulator survey um, in the other OES environmental countries, and we're kind of using that to gauge interest from regu regulators to engage on these sort of topics. Um, and the next step, hopefully, as you mentioned, is to engage regulators in the different OES environmental countries on this. Um, we did um, hold a workshop with UK regulators on the monitoring data sets discoverability matrix, understanding that a lot of the experience consenting is with um, UK regulators. And so it was great to hear their feedback there. So that's a really great point, and we would love to um, expand this out if possible. Um, the next question is, someone is looking forward to those guidance documents, which is great feedback to hear. Um, and when we are, um, they're asking, when do we expect to publish them? Uh -huh. <laughs> um, we are delivering in the next week a draft framework for what those will look like um, uh, to the OES group. And uh, that is going to be a major focus of what we're going to do over the next year. So I would really hope uh, it really is dependent on each country being able to kind of get theirs together. Um, I would hope by, um, you know, next spring to summer, we would start to be able to roll those out. It, um, we may be being very optimistic of how difficult this will be. And I think part of the, the art of this is going to be how far do you delve down? 
um, because everybody recognizes whenever a developer develops a project, a regulator receives an application or has discussions for consenting or, right, or permitting, it's different. And so being able to um, really get to a level of detail that is helpful without um, writing a, a, you know, a huge tome is going to be the, the trick. But my really hope will start to get some out. And I think European ones are the obvious ones that will um, maybe in the US will come out first because um, Europe, of course, with so many nations following um, similar, um, at least having to, to uh, step up to similar um, uh, directives uh, may make it a little bit easier to figure out how to do that across across those countries, but I may be being overly optimistic. Great, thank you. Um, the last question that I see for now is how can cumulative impacts be assessed if risk for underwater noise or EMF is retired before a device is even tested in the water? It seems like this might do more harm as well as be more difficult to revisit environmental monitoring after the fact. And basically at what point um, or what has to happen for a risk to be unretired? I think you've addressed a little bit about that, but there might be some nuance in here to answer. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a really, really good point. How do you get that feedback loop to say, hey, we have to go back in and get that? And I do think that this whole concept of adaptive management um, is terribly important and setting some thresholds early on where everybody agrees um, and uh, that, that if certain things happen, certain actions need to be taken. I think for things like underwater noise and EMF, and the reason we tackled these ones first, it's a little simpler. Um, with the caveats that were presented to us by experts at these workshops, let's talk about noise again. Um, getting a good sound graph out of the device that's going in the water, um, and um, also getting a good ambient soundscape before uh, deployment so that you really can understand what the sound of the device sounds like versus other sounds in the environment. I think that that is going to make it fairly simple um, as say uh, a device, uh, a project is consented for say three devices. We know what that sound will look like. We can model um, the sound propagation from those three centers of noise. Um, and if by having the uh, TC114 uh, technical specification to measure that sound properly, we have a real advantage there. We know we're doing it consistently. So uh, that one is, um, unless that consent was suddenly opened back up to say from three devices, we're going to 30 devices, in which case more um, monitoring might be needed. That one I think is fairly, that's just physics. The same is true for EMF. If we are um, uh, have a better sense of what specific cable configurations look like carrying certain amounts of power and therefore what the magnetic and induced electrical field being emitted is. I think we can model that really quite well. Um, again, if you suddenly went to a larger number of devices, more monitoring would be needed. Um, when we come to the things that deal with animal behavior like um, collision risks, this is another reason why this is tricky because animal behavior is very adaptable. It changes. Um, there are is every reason to, to um, think that um, different species in different areas may behave a little bit differently. So that's why that one is still tough. So hopefully I kind of answered that. I think that there are uh, management methods like adaptive management that can really be helpful here. Great. Uh, we have one question that just came in. I'm going to read it aloud while I read it too. Um, advancements in environmental monitoring tools and methodology often happen in conjunction with industry when research techniques get applied on a commercial scale. As a practice, should projects that have had risk retired retain some level of environmental monitoring but not have it necessarily weigh on the permitting process? Or should a policy be in place to proactively monitor areas of interest prior to commercial mobilization? What a great question, statement and question. Um, there is no question that as an industry moves forward, we've seen this in all kinds of industries, uh, they become more efficient, they find ways to uh, monitor, develop tools to, to understand what's going on, 
both with their industrial processes, but also in the environment in which they're placed. Um, and, and for many industries, think oil and gas, et cetera, uh, automobile industry, um, we have seen this happen. We are in a funny position with the marine renewable energy industry. We're a new industry. We are going in the ocean um, at a time when there is heightened environmental considerations, never mind climate change. And we are concerned that if we try to wait for that natural sort of commercialization improvement in, in um, innovation and um, uh, efficiency to happen, we are uh, going to, be, it's gonna take a very long time to happen and this industry could be at risk at really moving forward. So some of the things we're trying to do like risk retirement, adaptive management is really trying to move that forward faster. And I think that, that um, the, the concept put forward here exactly right. There probably should be some ongoing work in many of these areas. Maybe this is really in the national government interests to continue to um, fund a little bit of monitoring in areas. Um, research studies should probably be placed around where there are existing devices to really understand what's happening. So we continue to build these knowledge bases. It's one of the reasons we, it was just touched on very briefly, but test, test centers where um, uh, wave and tidal devices are going in the water to test the technology are the optimum places to learn more and gather more of these data and perhaps um, add to this evidence base towards retiring risk. There has been sort of a, 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 a yeah, process, uh, a, a trend of not doing environmental monitoring when de devices go in the water. And we understand at these test centers, we understand why it's fabulously expensive to just get the devices in the water. But these are opportunities that really should not be missed. And we hope that, um, that the uh, more of this evidence base will go on being collected there as well as at others at uh, around projects. But it, it really is, if we want this industry to flourish. We cannot um, put too much more uh, weight on developers to go on collecting more and more data just so we can enlarge that evidence base. Great, thank you, Andrea. I think that is all the questions I see for now. If anyone has any last remaining questions, please do type those in now. We just have a few minutes left on the webinar. And there has uh, been a couple that came to me privately. Um, uh, somebody, uh, James thought that there was, uh, Germany may have set thresholds and legislation for offshore wind. I'm assuming that's around, um, uh, maybe around noise, maybe around DMF. Anyway, we'll follow up on that. We'll follow up with you, James. Thank you. Let me just take a quick check. Lots of good questions coming in. Um, quite a number of questions about, uh, uh, you know, have we seen um, uh, risk retirement applied anywhere? And can we see use an example of where we see that a risk has either been retired or at least sort of downscaled from using data from elsewhere? And um, again, I'd refer you to the uh, State of the Science report. Um, there is a uh, chapter on risk retirement and there are some cases in there where we really struggled to find where data had been collected at one project and then applied directly to kind of put aside a uh, more uh, monitoring at another. But we have found that there were a number of projects, particularly in the UK, where learning that happened, data that were collected at one project became directly applicable to another. And I can't bring up examples to mind right now, but if you go into that, I think it's chapter 13 in State of the Science, Risk Retirement, you'll find there some of those case studies are written up. And to add to that, a lot of it, we were hearing that it was happening, but it wasn't documented anywhere. Mm -hmm. So something we've been trying to work on and hopefully can continue to work on is actually documenting those cases where this data transferability does happen. Um, because I think there's more willingness from regulators to transfer data if they know it's been successfully used before. Great. And then there's some final questions about next steps. Well, our next steps really are, we are gonna continue doing what we're doing. We will be working on that oceanography, uh, oceanographic changes, uh, systems changes, uh, white paper. That's coming right along. 
and we are going to work on these guidance documents. Um, we do intend to continue to press forward on uh, collision risk because that one is still the, uh, the tough one and from a research point of view, a really interesting one. Um, we are looking to try to do a, a workshop probably sometime this fall on some of the additional collision risk questions. It's going to be a, a virtual workshop and we'll make sure uh, that you're kept apprised of that. Um, in case you're not getting Tethys Blast, which is our every other week uh, newsletter, uh, email newsletter as it will, were, that um, announces all of these um, uh, events, please do go to, to Tethys, tethys.pnnl.gov and sign yourself up and you'll get notified of these. Um, but we do hope to continue uh, moving forward on each of these fronts. And um, I think Michaela said it earlier, but I really encourage anybody, if you know of data sets, if you know of evidence that we do not have, if you go visit the evidence base on, online on TETHIS, um, please refer us to them. We think we've got pretty good, um, you know, kind of lines out there trying to find uh, any work that's being done, but we are really open to anything that uh, anybody's got squirreled away that would help us. So thank you. So I guess we're about done. Yeah, I don't see any more questions. We have a few minutes left, five minutes left in our time today. So if there are any last minute questions, we'll hang on uh, for a few minutes. And, and please look for this survey to, to land in your email box because we really would like your feedback. But I really appreciate the great and thoughtful questions. Thank you. And I'll maybe add to Andrea's um, note to sign up for the Tethys Blast. We also have a separate mailing list specifically for marine renewable energy webinars. You can also find that on Tethys as well. So you'll get announcements in the Tethys Blast, but if you want specific announcements for webinars such as these, please do sign up for that mailing list, which you can also find on Tethys. Great, there it is. And I should just mention, it's only a few questions that hopefully shouldn't take too long. Um, it's pretty short and sweet, but it will be really helpful to get your feedback on um, what content you'd like to see from us, as well as what you thought of Earth's retirement. Okay, well, if there are no more questions, I just really wanna give a big uh, thank you to everybody for spending the time with us today um, and, and thinking about this and getting, it looks like we've gotten some really positive feedback and some, some really uh, challenging things to think about. So um, uh, on behalf of our whole team at PNNL and uh, OES Environmental, I'd like to thank you very much and um, really credit our uh, funding from the US Department of Energy and also from Ocean Energy Systems um, for making this work possible and also for the ongoing encouragement we've really had from the international community. So thank you very much, everybody.